This presentation is called Sexual Selection and Parental Investment. So this week's topics, as we noted at the start, are sexual selection in relation to parental investment. And then we've been looking at inclusive fitness in relation to parental investment. And we're going to quickly tie them together. The question we'll start with is, how is sexual selection related to parental investment? And the way we're going to answer that is with what's called the initial inequality. And this is the idea that males and females among mammals certainly make very different investments in their offspring uh, from the beginning. And we can see that in this image of how small the sperm is compared to how large the egg is that the female has put a larger investment into that egg uh, than the male has into the sperm. And the idea here is that how much parental investment is made is related to the kind of reproductive strategy that's undertaken, and that helps shape sexual selection in ways that operate differently for males and females. So in the majority of mammals, mothers invest more and if we ask the question, why the mother, a series of arguments have been made on this. And one is that you have a lot higher confidence if you're the mother that the offspring is genuinely your genetic offspring. So maternity confidence is high. Uh, secondly, as we noted in the slide, an egg is bigger than a sperm. And from the very beginning, you've made a bigger investment than has the male. Then on top of that, there's the months of gestation. In humans, nine months of gestation, when that offspring is living in your body, imposing a cost on you. And then that's followed by months of nursing. And in some cases, that might be 36 or 48 months of nursing. And having that offspring with you most of the time, now that's a heavy investment on the part of mothers. If we look at the father, why aren't the fathers investing more? And in some species, they do invest almost as much as the mother. But one reason why they might not is that paternity confidence can be quite low relative to maternity confidence. Then we have that observation that the sperm is smaller than an egg, and men have a lot of sperm that are inexpensive for them to produce. Men don't involve themselves in gestation, and there's no nursing on the part of fathers. So these things add up to the mother having invested a lot more into the offspring than the father. And the idea is that this shapes the patterns of sexual selection in divergent ways. So this is called Bateman's principle, that reproductive strategies diverge between the sexes. Females produce high cost eggs Whereas males produce low-cost sperm, there's no pregnancy for males and no nursing afterward. But there's another aspect to this that Bateman drew on, and this is that more matings for females usually will result in the same number of offspring. So that females don't gain, and of course there's some exceptions to the rule here, but the notion that Bateman had, and that's generally the case in mammals, is that as females mate with more males, their reproductive success stays flat. They can only become pregnant so many times in a certain amount of time. Whereas for males, more matings do turn into a greater number of offspring. The expectation here then of all of this is that females will put more of their energy into parental effort. There will be higher parental effort on the part of females. And there will be higher effort put into mating on the part of males. So we have to go back here to this idea of trade-offs between our use of energy that our body has available. One thing that we can do with our energy is invest it into our own survival. Uh, maybe feeding ourselves or getting away from a predator. That's a somatic investment of energy. But in order to reproduce and have our genes in the next generation, we have to make some reproductive investment. And that's an investment in inclusive fitness. 
So we can take that reproductive investment and we can subdivide it. So reproductive investment, part of that can be put into parental effort. We can put our reproductive effort into the offspring that we've already conceived. But reproductive investment can also be invested in mating effort. And basically, Bateman's rule here is the idea that males and females will deploy their resources differently with, again, males investing more proportionally in mating effort and females investing more proportionally in parental effort. And once you have males and females connected in this way, uh, there's going to be this struggle between them over how much parental effort is invested and how much time is left over for mating effort. And the result of this, then, are these sex bias strategies of sexual reproduction. Uh, the classical ones from Darwin's day are of male-male competition and female choice. So Darwin argued that the main forms of sexual selection that you'll observe are first between males for access to females. And if one male can outcompete other males, they can raise their reproductive fitness substantially. Uh, through male-male competition. On the other hand, females, if they can exercise choice about which males they mate with, can bring out some elaborate uh, unexpected characteristics in males. And Darwin's favorite example of this was the tail of the male peacock as opposed to the peahen. And he proposed that the peacock's tail was the product of female choice on the part of the peahen. Now, another way that we can approach this same topic of how parental investment is related to uh, sexual selection is through inequalities in sex ratios. And this is interesting because the basic theory here was developed by a geneticist named Ronald Fisher. And Fisher predicted that we should see balanced sex ratios. And this was on the assumption of monogamy. So the idea here is that you have a certain number of males and females who are going to partner up with one another. And if that's the case, then what should happen is a movement towards 50% males and 50% females. And here's the logic behind this. If there are more males than females, then daughters will have higher mating success than sons. And that will give a benefit to parents to put more effort into raising sons until the number of sons come up and equal the number of daughters. And on the other hand, the same thing holds if there are more females than males. In that case, uh, parents should invest in sons until the number of sons comes up to balance the number of daughters. So the notion here is that assuming pairing off occurs, um, and anybody who's left in the majority, if there's uh, more males than females, that means that some males aren't going to have a chance to mate. And that will mean that you should invest into having females, which will increase them proportionally. However, we often see inequalities in sex ratios. And uh, Robert Trivers was part of this thinking as well in what's called the Trivers-Willard hypothesis. And this starts with the observation that Robert Trivers made in a lecture that in most human societies, females marry up the social ladder. So social anthropologists have long described what they call hypergamy. And this is the tendency for women to marry up into higher social standing. On the other hand, in most human societies, males will marry down the social ladder, which means they will marry women who are of lower social standing than they are, especially if the system is polygynous. But it need not be, and this is called hypogamy. So what's the result? Well, if we take female hypergamy, marrying up, and we combine that with male hypogamy, marrying down, then what we should see is an excess of unmarried males at the bottom. And that's because those males are down there at the bottom and the females have married up and left them there. We should also see an excess of unmarried females at the top. And this is because the males at the top have married females from the bottom and that leaves females at the top without partners and they can't marry down. 
And so the Trivers-Willard hypothesis makes a prediction based on this that if you're at the bottom of a social order, you'll invest more effort into raising daughters than sons. And if you're at the top, you'll invest more effort into raising sons. And this indeed does seem to hold. You have to modify this to apply it to other species, but it does indeed seem to hold in human societies. So this is talked about now as son-biased investment on the one hand, if you're at the top of the scale, and daughter-biased investment on the other, if you're at the bottom. What we're trying to draw together here is some connections between sexual selection and parental investment and inclusive fitness. And we have to think about all of these concepts together. Thank you for listening.